533 AD. A major Eastern Roman expeditionary force, 17,000 soldiers, nearly 600 ships, prepares to leave Constantinople. Its objective is the Kingdom of the Vandals in North Africa. These were once some of the wealthiest provinces in the Roman Empire, until they were lost to the barbarians, with catastrophic consequences. Now, a century later, the Romans are returning. Emperor Justinian intends to liberate the people of North Africa from barbarian tyranny and the perils of Christian heresy. He entrusts this mission to Flavius Belisarius, the victor of Dara, who's just saved the regime by crushing internal revolt. Now he will lead Eastern Roman forces in the Emperor's campaign to reclaim the West. When the Western Roman Empire was overrun by barbarians in the 5th century, the Vandals emerged as perhaps the most enterprising of Rome's enemies. From Central Europe, they marched, killed and looted their way through Roman territory into Spain, and in 429 crossed into North Africa under the leadership of King Gesaric. There he founded a kingdom and took up piracy with skill and enthusiasm. In 455, Gesaric sacked Rome itself. 75 years later, Eastern Romans and Vandals had learned to tolerate each other. Emperor Justinian's relations with the Vandal King Hilderic were in fact extremely cordial. The two men exchanged gifts, and though Justinian regretted that Hilderic was an Arian heretic, he was pleased that he did at least allow Orthodox Christians in his realm to live in peace. Then, in 530 AD, there was a coup in the Kingdom of the Vandals. Gelimer, Hilderic's cousin and heir, seized power and imprisoned the ex-king. Unlike his hapless predecessor, humiliated in war by the Berber tribes, Gelimer was a proven warrior and cunning to boot. When Justinian scolded Gelimer as a usurper, the new Vandal King warned the Emperor to mind his own affairs, then for good measure, blinded one of Hilderic's nephews. Three years pass. Justinian makes peace with the Sassanid Empire and survives the Nika riots. Now he decides it's time to teach Gelimer a lesson. Imperial propaganda and the historian Procopius will later portray Justinian's war on the Vandals as part of a long-held plan to reconquer the Western Empire. For the sake of true belief in God and the liberty of our subjects. Modern historians are more skeptical. Justinian needs a victory to bolster his regime. Gelimer's actions have provided just provocation and the recovery of North Africa's wealthy estates will bring obvious benefits. Perhaps self-interest, opportunism and a sense of divine imperial mission all play a part in his decision to go to war. Many try to dissuade the Emperor. His senior advisor, John of Cappadocia, warns of the hazards and cost of a long-range seaborne operation. His generals are haunted by the fate of the last Roman expedition to North Africa, a huge fleet destroyed by Vandal fireships off Cape Bon. Justinian is not deterred. He orders the fleet and army to assemble at Constantinople. Belisarius, restored to the rank of Magister Militum per Orientum, General of the East, is given complete authority over the campaign. His force includes 10,000 infantry under the command of John of Dyrrachium, 5,000 cavalry divided between Federati and regular Roman units, as well as 600 Hun mercenaries, 400 Heruli mercenaries, and Belisarius's own Bucalari, probably around a thousand men. An old comrade, John of Armenia, will be his second in command. Solomon, 
a eunuch, his chief staff officer. It is not a large army, but most are hardened veterans from the wars in the east. Belisarius will also be accompanied by his wife, Antonina, an arrangement that doubtless provokes comments from conservative Romans, but seems to have been generally accepted. She will prove an insightful and effective ally to her husband, as well as a valuable agent to her patron and friend, Empress Theodora. The fleet set sail in June 533. Belisarius believes that much will depend on the discipline of his men. But before they've even cleared the Hellespont, two Hun mercenaries drunkenly murder a comrade. Belisarius has them hanged, in full view of the fleet. Then he addresses the army. If I were speaking to men going to war for the first time, I might struggle to persuade you that justice can be our greatest ally in obtaining victory. For those who don't understand the fortunes of war, think the outcome depends on strength alone. But you, I think, know that although it's men who do the fighting, it is God who judges the contest. This is why, Belisarius warns them, he will never turn a blind eye to their crimes. He concludes, I shall not consider any one of you my comrade, no matter how fearsome he is to the enemy, unless his hands are clean. The fleet continues its voyage, making stops to pick up supplies and additional troops. Along the way, 500 men die from eating mouldy bread, which Procopius blames on cost-cutting measures by the stingy John of Cappadocia. In Sicily, Belisarius receives fresh supplies from the Goths. There, as he ponders his next move, he receives stunning news. Not only are the Vandals completely unaware of his expedition, but Gelimer has sent his brother Zazo, with most of the Vandal fleet and 5,000 troops, to quell a revolt in Sardinia. Belisarius might have been tempted to land in Tripolitania, where Romanized locals are already in revolt against the Vandals. But reassured by the absence of the Vandal fleet, he decides to land in the Vandal heartland, within striking distance of their capital, Carthage. The landing is unopposed, but Belisarius is furious when some of his men steal from the locals. He has them punished, then speaks once more to the troops. The Libyans, being Romans from of old, are unfaithful and hostile to the Vandals. Now your lack of self-control has made the opposite true. He warns them that lawlessness will lose them the support of the people and lead only to defeat and death. But with good behaviour, you will have God on your side. The Libyan people will support you, and the Vandals will be at your mercy. Belisarius orders some of his most trusted men to infiltrate a nearby town, Selectum, to see if the people will come over to the Roman side. The soldiers enter discreetly at dawn. They inform local elders that Belisarius has come to overthrow Gelimer the Usurper and restore their freedom. The townsmen agree to let the army into the city and open the market to them. Belisarius is gracious and generous to the Libyans. Crucially, his men behave well. They pay for supplies and win the trust of the locals. Procopius, an eyewitness, records that from henceforth, the campaign is like moving through their own country. Belisarius begins his advance along the coastal road to Carthage. He knows Gelimer is somewhere inland, and could strike from almost any direction. So he orders John of Armenia, his second in command, to take 300 Bucalari and scout two miles ahead of the main army. Belisarius himself commands a strong rear guard. The Huns are posted as a flank guard, two miles inland. Their sea flank is protected by the fleet, 
keeping pace with the army's advance. The army marches about 10 miles each day, then fortifies a camp at night. When Gelimer receives news of the Roman landing, he sends a message to his brother Amatus in Carthage. First he is to execute Hilderic and the other prisoners. Then he is to gather all his men and join Gelimer at Ad Decimum, where they will ambush and destroy Belisarius's army. Ad Decimum, 10 miles south of Carthage. Here the coastal road passes through a narrow gap between a salt marsh and the sea. Gelimer knows Belisarius will have to pass this way, and that the headland of Cape Bon will separate him from his fleet. Amatus is to hold the road to Carthage, and when the Romans are fully engaged, Gelimer and his nephew Gibbamund will fall on their flank and rear. Belisarius and his army approach. Roman patrols report skirmishes with the Vandals. Gelimer is close. A few miles short of Ad Decimum, Belisarius gives the order to make camp, and sends John's vanguard ahead to scout the road. At Ad Decimum, they find Amatus with just a handful of troops. He has arrived too early. The rest of his men are still strung out on the road to Carthage. John and the Bucalari charge. Amatus fights bravely, killing 12 men before he is cut down. The Vandal survivors flee back towards Carthage, with John and his men in pursuit. Groups of Vandals coming up the road see the fleeing horsemen. They think the whole Roman army must be headed their way. They panic and join the rout. John and his men slay all the Vandals they can catch. Meanwhile, on the edge of the Salt Lake, the Huns have encountered Gibberman's column. According to a Hun custom, a single warrior rides forward to meet the enemy. This is the first time Gibbermund and his men have faced Huns, but they know their fearsome reputation. They are unnerved by the lone horseman and suspect a trap. When the Huns charge, the Vandals quickly turn and flee. Gibbermund is one of those killed in the rout. Gelimer is advancing between low hills that block his view of both Belisarius's camp and the fate of Gibbermund. Belisarius is also unaware that battle has been joined, but sends his Federati cavalry forward, expecting some skirmishing with the Vandals. When his cavalry reach at Decimum, they see signs of fighting and bodies. Then, several thousand Vandal horsemen appear behind them. The Federati commanders have no idea whether to advance or retreat. After a brief clash, the entire force retreats back towards the Roman camp. Gelimer is now in position to deal Belisarius a serious blow. If he heads north, he can trap and destroy John's isolated vanguard. If he moves south, he can hit the Roman cavalry while it's still confused and disordered. Instead, Gelimer discovers the body of his brother, Amatus, and is overcome with grief. As their king oversees his brother's burial, his perplexed troops look on and do nothing. Belisarius is given a crucial breathing space. He rallies his cavalry, reorganizes them, and leads them forward. The Roman cavalry fall on the Vandals with devastating force. The enemy are scattered. Gelimer and the survivors fly west. The road to Carthage is open. And it fell to Belisarius that day to win more fame than any other man of his time or indeed any of the men of olden times. Belisarius, wary of ambush, waits till dawn the next day before making his triumphal entry into Carthage. Once more his troops behave well, the citizens of Carthage are respected. 
this peaceful occupation of such a wealthy city in such times is remarkable. Belisarius sits on Gelimer's throne and eats the lunch that had been prepared for him. He attends to the requests and pleas of local citizens. But the Vandals aren't beaten yet. Belisarius receives news, intended for Gelimer, that Zazo has put down the Sardinian revolt and is returning with 5,000 men. Reinforced, Gelimer advances on Carthage. Belisarius leads out his army to face him at Tricamarum. The Roman cavalry camps near a small brook, where the Vandals catch them off guard, deploying for battle while the Romans are still making lunch. But again, Gelimer fails to exploit an advantage. He does nothing as the Romans deploy, and their infantry, which had fallen behind on the march from Carthage, gets into position. It's the Romans who attack first, when John of Armenia leads the Bucalari forward against the Vandal centre. Twice he is repulsed, but the third attack is made with greater force. Zazo himself is killed within sight of Gelimer. Belisarius orders the rest of his army forward. The Vandals flee, leaving behind 800 dead. The Romans have lost just 50 men. The Vandals take refuge in their camp, which contains all their baggage and their families. But when Belisarius brings up his infantry to begin the assault, King Gelimer flees. The fight is entirely one-sided. Panic soon engulfs the Vandal camp as everyone tries to escape. The Romans kill the men, enslave the women and children, and plunder all they can find. Belisarius cannot restore discipline until the morning. Gelimer flees towards the mountains. Belisarius sends John in pursuit with 200 horsemen, but five days later, John is accidentally killed by one of his own men. Belisarius grieves at the death of his old comrade. He sends Pharas and his Heruli to take over the pursuit of Gelimer. The Vandal King takes refuge with the Berber tribes. Three months later, hunger and the promise of comfort and clemency persuades him to surrender. Meanwhile, Belisarius sends one of his officers to Sardinia with the head of the king's brother Zazo. The island quickly submits to Roman rule, as too does Corsica. From Carthage, detachments and emissaries travel east and west as North Africa rejoins the Roman Empire. Settlements and outposts still suffer Berber raids, but Belisarius delegates this war to his able staff officer Solomon. He sails for Constantinople with his prisoners and a vast quantity of loot. He has learned that a small group of officers, motivated by envy and ambition, have told the Emperor that Belisarius plans to found his own kingdom in North Africa. Belisarius soon persuades Justinian in person that this is all lies, and his loyalty is absolute. The Emperor rewards him with a triumph, the victory parade with which, for a thousand years, the Romans had celebrated their greatest conquests. It's the first triumph to be awarded to anyone but an emperor in 500 years. He is also awarded the title of consul, once the senior political office in the Roman Republic, long since reduced to an honorary title. Belisarius' loot, including much of what the Vandals had plundered from Rome, is paraded in front of the citizens of Constantinople and the Emperor, along with his prisoners, including King Gelimer himself, who is heard to mutter words from the Old Testament, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. 
Whether such events as these ever took place before, I am not able to say. The Vandal Kingdom, at the height of its wealth and military strength, completely undone in so short a time by 5,000 men. For such was the number of horsemen who followed Belisarius and carried through the whole war against the Vandals. For whether this happened by chance or valour, one would justly marvel at it. Known to history as the Vandalic War, Belisarius' campaign has reclaimed one of the Roman Empire's wealthiest provinces in just six months with minimal losses. The Battle of Dara had proven his skill as a tactical commander. In North Africa, his victory comes through discipline and diplomacy, and a brilliantly successful Hearts and Minds campaign. But already it's clear there are those within the Empire who resent such success, and seek his downfall. Belisarius will not have long to rest on his laurels. A murder in far-off Tuscany is about to lead to his most formidable challenge yet. The victim is Amalasunta, daughter of Theodoric the Great. Her death means war between the Eastern Empire and the Goths. A war that will lead Belisarius to the gates of Rome itself. Big thanks to Legendarian for providing our Total War Attila gameplay footage. You can check out his own documentary YouTube channel using the link in the video description. Thanks to the Vandalic War mod crew for their modding support. Thank you also to Professor David Parnell of Indiana University Northwest, our series consultant. You can follow David on Twitter at ByzantineProf or via the link in our video description. And thank you of course to all the Epic History TV Patreon supporters who make this channel possible.